بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن الناس من يشري نفسه ابتغاء مرضات الله والله رؤوف بالعباد صدق الله عالي عظيم My dear respected most honorable elders, beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. First and foremost, we begin by <coughs> humbly thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by glorifying and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for enabling us with this uh, unique opportunity in the month of Ramadan, approaching the last 10 days to worship Him, to glorify Him, to learn more about His messenger and the life of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we pray that Allah azza wa jal will continue to facilitate such opportunities for us in the future for those of you who have seen um, some of the previous videos and the format of them and uh, are now tuned in to, uh, to this and you've seen the, the title of the video is Deen and Dunya Complementary Relationship um, it, this is based on how our understanding and how our perception has warped over time into focusing more on this dunya and less on uh, the deen. And on the other hand, sometimes in those very rare occasions, you have an individual or you have certain individuals who um, completely immerse themselves in deen, which is excellent, and forget about the dunya. Not knowing that they have uh, a certain, or there's certain aspects of the dunya that they leave behind, which their religion encourages them to be involved in. Like for example, an individual uh, who chooses to, to go out and, 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 uh, uh, and better himself, uh, engage in dhikr, teach others, but then his, uh, he has children at home, he has a family at home, who he has responsibilities towards and he doesn't fulfill those responsibilities to them. So there's certain aspects of the deen and dunya which have a complementary relationship, they intertwine. And, and that's something that we need, to, uh, we need to bridge that gap. And whereas the vast majority of us are just concerned with the dunya and success in dunya and forgetting about the true success in the akhirah, we find people working so incredibly hard for this worldly life and they pretend as if they've forgotten completely about the fact that they're going to die one day and this period of time that they have in this world is only uh, a, a, a minor, uh, is just a small glitch um, you know, in the matrix that is, that, that is life, um, uh, completely neglecting um, you know, their uh, responsibilities to that everlasting life and in, in terms of uh, achieving um, success there, success here is more important to them. So the most important thing for us is how can we reconcile um, between the dunya and akhirah, between not completely uh, depriving ourselves of the delights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed and the pleasures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed upon this earth while keeping our focus um, and efforts on achieving Jannah and, and, and uh, going, uh, getting into paradise. As always, we refer back to the, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there were three, and when you look at some of the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you'll notice some, uh, those of you, some of you may have come across this narration before. Three individuals, they came to the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, and they asked about how he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he worships Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And they wanted to know how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam achieved this state, and how... They wanted to, and their intentions were, were sincere. They wanted to emulate the Prophet Ali And when they got the answer, they thought, yeah, well, of course, since uh, the Prophet is a prophet, and غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِن ذَنْبِهِ وَمَا تَأَخَّرْ Forgiven for him are his past and, and future sins, in the sense that he doesn't commit any sins. They thought they have to go over and uh, beyond what the Prophet was doing, in order to be in the good graces of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there was a man who said, I'm going to fast and I'm not going to break my fast. Another individual from, from among them says, I'm going to um, pray, I'm going to stay up the entirety of the night praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And another individual says, I'm not going to get married, I'm going to stay celibate so I can 
focus my attention uh, solely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not going to have any distractions um, that can take me away from his worship. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he heard about these three individuals and he called them. And he said to them, Ayyukum mithli, which one of you is like me? He said, I fast and I break my fast. Asumu after, I break my fast. I um, uh, uh, stay up at night worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a portion of the night and I go to sleep for a portion of the night. He said, I get married, right? So don't deviate from my sunnah, don't deviate from my, my practice. So I do all of these things, as in, uh, uh, there's a complementary relationship that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had. He would sleep knowing that his body has rights over him. He would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing that his soul also has rights over him. He would fast knowing that uh, he needs to strengthen that inner spirit and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would break his fast knowing that his body has certain limitations that in terms of it has a right over him. His body has a haq over him. And that's the message that he was trying to convey to the companions. Although the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was far and uh, beyond what the companions could understand with regards to his worship, there were days that the Prophet sallallahu perpetually fasted, which is impossible for us, but it was made possible for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But he did all of this to show us that, look, you know, you, you've, got to, uh, you've got to have that complementary relationship. You've got to have one eye on the dunya and one eye on the akhirah. Islam does not ask for celibacy. Islam, as much as we are in isolation right now, Islam does not ask us to live in isolation. Um, it does not ask us to cut ourselves off or cut ourselves away from society, completely depriving us of the pleasures those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made, made halal for us, made permissible for us in this dunya. Our religion is not one of extremes. Like I mentioned the other day, there's, there's extremism within faith, extremism following certain aspects, ghuluv, excessiveness, and, and tanattu, right? Um, uh, being harsh and severe in, in, in what you're doing. We shouldn't be excessive uh, uh, in, in the things that we do Just like I spoke the other day We shouldn't be excessive in, in eating We shouldn't be excessive in talking too much um, We should be more focusing on uh, understanding the realities of life And the, pos- the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us here um, We have to have one eye on the dunya Knowing that our bodies require food to eat But we should also focus on our souls That our souls require the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala To... Um, uh, to uh, gain that everlasting bliss in the akhirah. And the key is always to have akhirah at the top of your mind um, and, and always at the top of your list of priorities. You know, we, we, we can and we should have families, but they shouldn't distract us from our, from our Islamic duties. We can seek uh, halal, lawful means of employment, of living, but, you know, we, can't, we have to leave our employment and turn, our, and turn our back on it when the time of prayer comes or when the time of Jum'ah comes. So we have to understand that uh, although they have a complementary relationship, one is above the other. Akhirah is always going to be uh, more important than the, uh, the dunya. Our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is a fuel and a light for our dunya activities. Imam, Imam Tufyan uh, Athawri, Rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, improve your secret and your private life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he'll improve your public and your social life. Make matters well between you and Allah, and Allah will make matters well between you and the people. Work for the hereafter, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be enough for you in terms of your worldly concerns. Um, Ibn Qayyim, he stated that this dunya, and this is for, for those of us, for all of us in fact, who chase after the dunya. The dunya is like a shadow. You run after it and you'll never be able to catch it. If you try to chase your shadow, you'll, you're chasing ghosts, right? You're never going to be able to catch your sh- shadow. Um, he said, turn your back on your shadow and keep walking in the direction that you're supposed to be going and it has your shadow has no choice but to follow you, right? So the dunya is going to follow you when you focus on what, 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 your, what you focus on your plan and your plan is to... Uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, have akhirah at the top of your priorities and be focused on pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, 
Because it's something that we haven't seen. Essentially, what our religion is telling us um, is you've got all of these pleasures here. Right? You could do whatever you want. There's nobody to, to, to stop you. Um, but control yourself here and you're going to get everlasting bliss in the Akhirah. And the everlasting bliss you can't see. You don't know. You don't know how it's going to feel. You can only imagine. Right? It takes iman. It takes a certain st- standard of belief in order for us to, to say, well, yes, you know what? That's what I'm going for. Right? This is what the the, the, the Anbiya, the Awliya Allah, the, the friends of Allah and the Prophets of Allah, this is what they did. They focused, they, they knew that, that, that whatever is here is, 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 is minuscule. Whatever is here is, is temporary compared to the everlasting bliss in the Akhirah. And there were companions among the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there's certain story, I think I've got about 10 minutes to just tell you of a few um, stories uh, regarding some of the companions and how they how they valued success what they considered to be the path to success Sayyidina Suhaib uh, uh, Ar-Rumi he was uh, a slave um, who he's he's called Ar-Rumi the Roman um, because he was taken as a slave in, in in the Byzantine Empire and he was raised among them and then he escaped later coming back to Mecca Mecca and he was a poor destitute individual when he came back but originally he was an Arab from the Arab world who was taken as a slave in the Byzantine Empire when he uh, escaped uh, uh, from from Rome and he came back to to Mecca he was destitute um, uh, he was poor he had no means of of, of, of employment um, but he had certain skills that he had he had acquired in his time in the Byzantine Empire and he adopted those skills and he became uh, a wealthy merchant. Uh, he became so successful um, that he was the envy of the Quraysh. And when the time of the Hijrah came, Sayyidina Suhaib, who had made, uh, who had accepted Islam, he made the Hijrah alone also. Uh, during his, uh, his migration, the Quraysh, naturally because he was a man of influence and a man of great wealth, they stopped him. Uh, they caught up with him. And uh, uh, he, he ran up a small uh, sort of a hill and they, they, uh, uh, they surrounded him, they encircled him. Um, and he took out his bow and his arrow um, uh, and he said, Listen, innakum ta'alamuna inni armakum, that each and every one of you know that you know, I, I'm the best archer from among you. Um, by Allah, if you come near me, I will, I will you know, let each and every arrow that I have fly from my bow uh, until I have no arrows left. And, and, and perhaps you may reach me, but I, I'm going to take a fair few of you down with me. Uh, but instead of doing that, instead of, uh, of, of this loss of life, how about I make you a trade? How about I make you a deal? The deal is that you know that I'm wealthy, you know I'm rich. So what I'll do is, I'll tell you exactly where I've hidden my wealth in Mecca. Because that's what he did before he left, because he knew, he had belief in the prophecy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said to the uh, Muhajirun, don't worry, you know, we're, you know, it's a migration. It's not uh, exile as if we're never going to come back. One day, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew his vision was that he's ultimately going to come back and conquer Mecca one day. So he understood that also. So he buried his wealth there in, in, in Mecca, Suhaib, before leaving. So he said to, to his uh, potential captors, he says to them, listen, the, these are the, the places where I buried my wealth. And he tells them exactly uh, those places. And, and you go consume my wealth, do whatever you want with it, let me go. Right? That's a trade-off. And, and, and they readily accept it. And so here, at that moment, he could have lied. He could have told them, well, my be- wealth is buried here, <clears throat> but it's actually buried elsewhere. But no, he tells them exactly where he's buried uh, every dirham, every dinar. And then he leaves. And, and, and when he arrived in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Medina, uh, it's reported by the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he walked to the outskirts of the city and he just waited and he looked out uh, in the open um, desert and uh, sl- you know, the companions were waiting with the Prophet until a fig- figure began to emerge from, from far away and, and, and that figure began to come closer and closer and closer. And when the figure 
came closer, they noticed it was a man and they noticed it was Suhaib uh, a Rumi who had migrated from, 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 uh, from Mecca. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he embraced him, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Rabi had tijaratuka ya Aba Yahya. What a beautiful transaction you have made, O Abu Yahya. As in you've sacrificed your dunya and you've purchased a place in the Akhirah. You've sacrificed a piece of this dunya in order for you to um, uh, achieve everlasting bliss in the Akhirah. Um, and he never felt, Suhaib, you know, he never felt that it was an unjust bargain. Money, gold, the entire world, everything, the riches of it, you could have placed in Suhaib's hands at that moment in time and said to him, no, no, stay in Mecca and leave the Prophet. He would not have done so. That's how strong his level of Iman was. And that's the difference between us and the companions of the Prophet. That our level of Iman is so low that we, we can't seem to let go, no matter how much we, you know, in our hearts, in our minds, we, we believe, we say amanna, but we don't really actually believe truly. Because if we truly believed, then it would be worthless to us. Then, then we wouldn't be clinging on. We're like that, you know, that, that child that clings onto your leg and refuses to get go, let go. We're like that with the dunya. That, you know, no, uh, I'm, I'm, I can't let it go because if I did, I would drown. Um, this is, this is success. When you look at the companions like Sayyidina Suhaib, Sayyidina Suhaib was actually that companion who said, Umar radiallahu ta'ala, and when he was stabbed and when he was martyred, and he, before he passed away, he said, let Suhaib uh, lead the men in prayer. Um, and and Suhaib had, had gained such a state um, in accordance with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, there's a, uh, subhanAllah, there's, there's, there's a story of, uh, of of Zahir ibn Hizam or ibn Haram, right? Um, and he was uh, he's uh, he, he was a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who was not of um, uh, pleasant facial appearance. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he came to him one day um, while while Zahir was w- w- was selling some goods in the marketplace, and he embraced Zahir from from behind. Um, and when he embraced him from from behind. The Prophet ﷺ, uh, Zahir c- couldn't tell who it was. And the Prophet ﷺ placed his blessed eye, uh, hands over Zahir's eyes. And then he says, uh, uh, you know, who, who, who is going to, who is going to buy this slave from me? Who is going to buy this slave from me? The Prophet ﷺ said. And uh, uh, Zahir uh, said, uh, SubhanAllah, Zahir said, he, even though he, the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell him that it was him. He recognized the Prophet ﷺ from the blessed smell, uh, the, the fragrance that was coming from the hands, emanating from the hands of the Prophet ﷺ. And he turned and he said, Oh, Ya Rasulullah, oh Messenger of Allah, um, by Allah you'll find me a poor cell, as in I'm, I'm worthless, I'm not worth anything in the marketplace, as in I'm, I'm, I'm unsellable. And, and the Prophet ﷺ, he turned him around and he, he grabbed him by the shoulders, he held him by the shoulders and he said, By Allah, you are valuable. Um, as in, with the Prophet of Allah, you have great value. In the eyes of Allah, you have great value. So although the dunya may have looked upon this companion as, Oh, well, you know, he, he's not really worth anything. Why? Because he, he's not an attractive individual, doesn't really have much going for him, and doesn't really have much wealth. So there's not much... Uh, that he has to offer them. However, he had a- attained a state, such a state with Allah and his Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and the, that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, by Allah, you're valuable to Allah and you're valuable to his Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, you know, th- there's, th- there's, there's so many examples of companions who had a- a- attained a level, a status, who were disregarded in this world. And yet, they were never disregarded by his prophet, uh, by the prophet and and and, and, and his lord. There was a, there's a story uh, of a um, Abyssinian uh, black woman who we don't even know the name of. Her name is unknown. Who, she would regularly sweep the masjid of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And when she died, the prophet, the companions of the prophet, they prayed over her. They didn't inform the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam of her passing. They read her janazah and they buried her. When the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam later noticed. She was missing from the masjid and he didn't see her cleaning the masjid. Um, he inquired about her 
and the Prophet, the, the companions informed him, Ya Rasulullah, she passed away and, and we buried her. And the Prophet وسلم, became extremely angry. He said, why did you not inform me so that I could have prayed over her, so I could have read her janazah? This is a woman who is not named in the ahadith. She's not even mentioned. Uh, her name isn't even mentioned in the books of hadith. All we know of her is she was a woman who used to come and clean the masjid of the Prophet وسلم, And through that, she had... Um, uh, uh, crafted for her a, a space inside the Prophet Sallallahu heart and therefore she had earned uh, a place for herself uh, in, in, in Jannatul Firdaus and that's all it was it was a simple act of just cleaning the masjid and although others may have disregarded her and not, not viewed that and seen it as being something that 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 uh, that they could utilize or that can uh, gain her fame and notoriety in this world but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet noticed. That's why it's important for us not to do things for the sake of, of the dunya. Even if we're doing something which is a religious thing, but doing it for the sake of dunya. So for example, we have you know, um, charities, certain charities that are, um, that are running uh, various appeals. And, and you see that throughout the month of Ramadan. So it's, it's a noble thing, collecting funds for the sake of uh, of, of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for the sake of the, the message which is to take care of those who are poor and less fortunate uh, those who are vulnerable uh, to care for them but you have to do it with the right in intentions you have to do it f for the sake that you're trying to please Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and not for the sake of, 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 of making your chari charity the best charity and having uh, you know, the, the most amount of money that you could possibly donate so people could look into you and say, MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, what a way he has with the people. He can gain so much money from, from them. No. So you see that woman, she wasn't cleaning so that people would look at her and say, oh, well, what a wonderful woman. She's there cleaning the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. No, she was just cleaning because she focused on, on uh, that connection between Allah, between her and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that connection between her and the Prophet sallallahu um, alayhi wa sallam. This is why that relationship between the deen and the dunya needs to be a complementary relationship. But we have to focus um, more on the akhirah, especially now when the vast majority of us um, are so focused on this dunya. We're so focused on, on little... Uh, um, pleasures of this life and that we've completely forgotten about the fact that we have to die one day and when that hard reality hits us um, then it's going to be too late for us to turn back um, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me a new tawfiq and the ability to act upon the teachings of the Quran the noble sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa akhirul da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu